few others. Now, how many of you need the notes? You did not get the handouts. Would you put your hand up? These men are waiting to help you. Over here, over here. All right, okay. Okay, just a couple of things. Um, I mentioned to you this morning about our, um, our upcoming Bible conference starting the 17th of next month. It's on a Wednesday night. And uh, we have several couples will be flying in. And so uh, we may need some folks that could help to maybe take somebody out to lunch or something. Uh, we've got lodging for them. But uh, they'll be stuck at the motel unless you've got a car you want to loan them. But uh, if there's any way you can help or you'd be willing to help, uh, let Brother Murphy know, and uh, then we'll uh, kind of can work out the rides for these folks. Uh, a few of them need to be picked up at the airport, and uh, so we need to do that. Also, while the men are up at the uh, men's retreat, the wives will be, those who bring their wives will still be down at the... Um, down at the motel and they may need some transportation so uh, I don't know what the need is right now but if you could uh, you know if you could spare a little time and help somebody you let brother Murphy know when you could do that and he'll know how to schedule and uh, and to make plans for these folks uh, also I mentioned this morning our response cards and uh, brother Murphy just read our report and I want to I want to go over something with you just just briefly, um, about a couple of years ago, I mentioned on a Sunday night the reason, one of the reasons we, we would like for all of our members to reach forward on Sunday morning and get this card is so it encourages other people to do it. If guests come in here and I say, would you reach forward, Brother Murphy says, would you reach forward and get a card, and you and I just sit there like wooden Indians. Uh, obviously, I shouldn't say Indians, that's not proper anymore, wooden, whatever. <laughs> you got to be careful. I, am, I really want to be politically correct, okay? So uh, if, you're an, if you're an Indian, I apologize, okay? Um, anyway, just don't sit there like a bump on a log. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I need for you on Sunday morning when Pastor uh, Murphy ask for people to reach forward and get the card. Uh, would you do me a favor and just do that, would you? And uh, don't worry if you can't write. It, the folks will never know. Just get, just get a card and uh, hang on to it and look at it. And then uh, he'll tell you what to do with it. Put it in your Bible and then we'll talk about it later. But I want you to do that so that other folks who come will be encouraged to do it. That's why we want to do that. We use this card. It helps us to know who our visitors are and uh, also, to, also to meet ever other, other folks' needs. Now, one other thing about this is uh, there are a lot of areas on the back of this card where people can indicate needs. And, uh, you know, we could use uh, two or three people who, uh, who, who have some uh, people skills in talking to people and, and helping them uh, who would be willing to make some phone calls. Maybe somebody calls up and says, I'm interested in growing in my relationship with Christ. If we had someone that week could make a phone call, and we, we will tell you what you need to know to answer these folks and, and respond to them. And I, I, just for instance, if somebody filled this out and they said, I, 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 I'm interested in growing in my relationship with Christ, my first question would be, have you taken class uh, 201? because that's where it's at, right? Okay. They say, yes, I have. I say, okay, here's what you need to do. You need to get that notebook out, and you need to go through that material again and look at it and do what it says. Will you do that? You understand? And because that's all you're going to tell them anyway, other than they need to be in church, you know, I say, you know, have you, are you coming to the Sunday night service? Yeah, okay. Are you coming to Thursday night? Okay, yeah. Are you tithing? Yeah. No. You don't, you don't need to go there. But I think you understand what I'm saying. So it's really simple, uh, but it's really important. And if you can help with this, please let Brother Murphy know that. Also, uh, Julie Mitchell, are you here? Julie, uh, you're in charge of the bookstore, is that right? Okay. Um, I've had some folks just 
hundreds of people wanting to buy my new book. And it isn't in the bookstore, right? So I'd like for you to see uh, Pat Perry. Where's you, where are you, Pat? See Pat right after church. She'll show you where they're at. And you can get them down there, okay? Because we don't want any trouble. We don't want folks, you know, causing trouble because my books are not down there. All right, I think that's all. Uh, let's go to, uh, you got the book of Ruth. And I want to read a few verses and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll... Uh, we'll We'll talk about it this evening. Verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem, Judea, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons was Mahalon and Kylon. Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judea, and they came into the country of Moab and continue there. Now, <coughs> you move on down it, uh, in uh, verse 3, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. All right? Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this good day and for the blessings of being in church and being with your people and fellowshipping in the homes of your folks. And, and uh, thank you for the good number here that, uh, who have taken the lead in ministries and want to serve Christ. And we pray for others that will uh, get put on the harness and step up to the uh, task. And we thank you for... Uh, our media workers and our hospitality workers, our nursery workers, and the folks that work with Sunday school and children's ministries, and the choir and the special music. We thank you for them. Pray you'll bless them. Now I pray you'll bless tonight as we uh, study this book. I pray you'll give me uh, wisdom and to say the right thing, and pray it'll be a help to folks here this evening. In Christ's name, amen. All right, now... Uh, Uh, Elimelech, his wife, Naomi, and uh, their two sons, uh, they lived in Bethlehem of Judea. And uh, you've seen that on the map. They may have it for you. I don't know. Maybe they don't. But uh, I didn't ask them to have it ready. So, But uh, nevertheless, it's in uh, Bethlehem of Judea. And during that time, there was a famine in the land. And the famines were not uncommon in, in, uh, in Bible, uh, Bible history. They're not uncommon in our day. Uh, we have not had to experience it, but in Africa and many other parts of the world, people certainly, uh, people are starving to death. And uh, so famine is really a horrible, horrible thing. So they determined to leave their country, their own country, their home, and uh, they uh, took... Uh, they went looking for work in the land of Moab. That land is uh, down south of, of the Sea of Galilee on the east, southeast side. And I believe last week I talked to you about where Moab and Ammon came from. Did I not? Okay. And um, also, uh, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, uh, Moab... Uh, refused to come out and uh, to greet them and help them. And uh, so God had uh, pronounced a curse upon the Moabites, and they were not permitted to enter into the congregation of Israel up through the tenth generation. Now that may be literal, the tenth generation, or it may be figuratively forever. Uh, I don't know for sure which, but I do know that God made an exception. And God can do that. He always can, and He does. And uh, so they went into the land of Moab, and while they're down in Moab, uh, Naomi's husband dies. And she is uh, left with her, uh, she is left uh, there a widow. And however, uh, she, still has, uh, she, she still has her two sons to take care of her, which... In those days, that was their social security program. 
And that's why in the Bible it was so important for, for women to have a son. Folks think they always were interested to have a son because they hoped they would have the Messiah. Well, I don't know of any scripture that says that. But I do know that, that it is uh, in that part of the world and in most of the world. That is why a boy is considered more important than a girl in that he would be, when he grew up, he would be the source of the security for the family. Now, you, do you have any of that in the Philippines, any of that, any of that kind of stuff? You don't know? Okay. Well, I know you do in India, and uh, where you're from over there, you have that. So you understand then why um, the, the having of sons was, was so important to them. And um, so that was their social security program. And, uh, of course, she, she has these two sons uh, to take care of her. And then we read that these two boys married uh, women of Moab. And one's name was Ophar, and the other one is Ruth. So these are Gentile girls, and we really don't know a lot about them, but certainly we can assume some things. And I think we could be safe in doing that. Now, in the course of the time, uh, the, in the course of time that uh, she was there, that Naomi was in Moab, both of her boys died, and they died childless. So now she is. Uh, now you have three widows uh, down in uh, in one family of Moab. So I think maybe as uh, as Naomi left Moab, she looked back. And uh, she could see that uh, really all she got there was, uh, was three graves. And uh, I mentioned this uh, last week, but I think there's an important lesson here, is that we must not let trouble where we are force us to where we ought not to be. I don't believe that uh, Elimelech, I can't even say his name, uh, and uh, Naomi, I don't believe that they were in the will of God by leaving uh, Israel. I think they should have stayed. And, uh, you know, God uh, uh, told, uh, you know, Abraham, he went down into Egypt and it turned out, <coughs> turned out bad for him. And, uh, and so uh, I think God wanted His people to stay in the land and uh, He would take care of them, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they fail to do it. And I think a lot of times we run from trouble and we, we fail to let God do His work in our life. Now, I know there's trouble you ought to run from. You know, if somebody's trying to kill you, it's okay to escape. I'm aware of that. But, uh, you know, we need to do a lot of praying about the decisions we make and make sure that uh, what we're doing is, uh, is the will of God. And if you and I run from every problem we have, we're always going to be running. And we're not going to learn anything. So we have, to, uh, we have to let God work in our lives through the difficulties and through the problems. And I, um, last week I took you back to Deuteronomy where God told Israel, He said, I led you through the wilderness and I tested you those 40 years to show you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And uh, many of the people didn't want to be in the wilderness. They wanted to go back to Egypt. And they kept wanting to go back. We're going to die out here. Uh, there's, there's no bread out here. There's no manna out here. And uh, so uh, in their heart they turned backward, back to, uh, back to Egypt. And uh, so God many times brings us into dry places. There will be a drought. But that doesn't mean that we're to run. A difficulty doesn't mean you're to run. Uh, that's not what it always means. So you need to pray for wisdom to know what to do. But if everybody ran every time there was a problem, we'd all be running. And it's not God's will that we do that. So I believe that we must not let the troubles where we are force us to, uh, to, 
to be where we ought not to be or to go where we shouldn't go. And I've seen people do that, and I believe that's exactly what's going on here. Not only that, in the time of trouble, we may turn to false security. We may turn to false security. Elimelech believed that he and his family would be more secure in Moab. I touched on that this morning. People operate on what they believe. And, uh, but you can believe the wrong thing. You can be an error in your belief. And so I think it's important that we get the mind of God on things. And uh, we need to understand God and how He operates. And, uh, you know, how we should pray and seek uh, wisdom from Him. But many times in trouble we turn to a false security. And that's where the, many of them went to Egypt. They, went to a, they looked to Assyria. And uh, they forgot that it was God who fed them and who took care of them. And so if we're not careful, we'll fall into the same trap because we have the same testings today. And so uh, he was wrong in his belief. He thought he would be more secure there, thought his family would. But there are four areas where I think people are prone to put their trust instead of putting it in the Lord. And uh, one is there is the security, the supposed security of possessions. And some put their, their trust in wealth. And uh, the Bible has so much to say about it. I want you to go to Proverbs with me. Keep your place in Ruth. But I'd like for you to go to the book of Proverbs over to the right. And we're going to look at uh, verses here. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you right there. And you are welcome to use it. But go to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. And uh, look down about verse 11, Proverbs 18, 11. It says, the rich, man's, uh, the rich man's wealth is his strong city, and as a high tower, as a high wall in his own conceit. So you see there's a false security. Money gives you a false security. Now, money is nice to have as a means to get what you need and uh, to pay your rent and buy your groceries and to pay your bills and whatever you have to do and to help other people. But I can tell you there's no security in money. The security is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only security you and I have is eternal security. And, uh, and so... Uh, uh, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and is a high wall in his own conceit. So he thinks it builds a wall around his city. He thinks it protects him. But, uh, and I don't mean this in a derogatory ma manner, but, you know, Bill Gates is just as prone to cancer as anybody else or an earthquake. Or a, or a disease or a disaster. And um, so you want to thank, thank God, you know, for people who have money and can hire people and provide jobs for them. You ought to thank God for that. Uh, I think it was uh, Abraham Lincoln that said, you never make the poor rich by making the rich poor. And... Uh, you know, there is a philosophy that being uh, taught in America in the political realm that, that they ought to take the money away from wealthy people and give it to poor people. I don't think that's a wise decision. I really don't. You know what, you ought to, if, if, you, want, if you want rich people to do anything for poor people, they ought to give them a job or help them get some training so they can feed themselves. You give a poor man money, he'll be poor in a year, in most cases. Jesus said, the poor you always have with you. You've heard the old saying, you know, give a man a fish and he has one meal. Teach him to fish and he can feed himself. So people don't need more money handed out to them. They need help in, in, in training and, and how to do jobs and how to 
find a job and how to keep a job. That's what folks need. See? Um, first of all, it's a, it's a dangerous thing to become dependent on people to give you money. What it does, it destroys all initiative on your part. See? And so there is this false security both by wealthy people and poor people think it will make them secure. I want you to look at Mark chapter, uh, chapter 4 and uh, verse 19. <clears throat> Jesus uh, certainly had the right perspective on money and, uh, and possessions. In Mark 4.19, And the cares of this world, now here it is, and the deceitfulness of riches, the deceitfulness of riches. You know, when people get rich, they think they're somebody else. They really do. They get, a, they get a wrong opinion of themselves. Very few people can manage it. You know, you know I think about, uh, well, I'll not say it. There's nobody in our church, believe me, that's rich. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And then, of course, the lust for other things enter in, choking out the word, and they become unfruitful. But there's the deceitfulness of riches. Also Israel, you'll notice that Israel trusted the presence of the ark of God above a right relationship with God. Israel thought if they had the ark with them, they would be safe. And they became superstitious. It's like folks that, uh, you know, they have, a, they have a rabbit's foot or they have a cross. You know, when they're kissing that cross or making the sign of the cross or, or doing things like that, you know. And, uh, and Israel thought if they had the ark with them, they could win battles and, and, uh, and be secure. But they found out they couldn't. Now, they had the ark of God, but their heart wasn't right with God, and so the Philistines took it. So there is this false security that comes from possessions. And you don't want to have that. Nothing wrong with having what God has given you. But you do not want to put your trust and your security in those things. You know. And I'm talking about 90% adults here tonight, and you pretty well got that figured out. The second mistake, I believe, is that we put security in people. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it can be the preacher... It can be uh, your husband or your wife and your father and your mother. Now, we look to these people for some security, but you do not want to put all of your uh, trust as far as security in anybody because all flesh is grass and the glory of man is as grass. And everybody's made of dust just like you. And everybody has problems just like you. So, you know, I mean, I may trust my doctor temporarily or trust the police officer for something or, or somebody for something. But I'm not about to put my whole life in their hands. And, and there's a danger when someone has done something for us and really helped us we have a tendency maybe to rely on them more than we should. It's not fair to them. See? And, uh, you know, I was just thinking before I came up here, you know, that in just a few days the countdown starts uh, for, uh, you know, my final days here. And I'm not looking forward to that. I love it here. I love it here. If I could stay in health and live to be 100, you'd have to put up with me. I mean, I love the ministry. I love pastoring. I love you folks. I love the, this church. And I was just thinking, you know, I probably, as up to this point, probably one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in my life. But I want to tell you what, this church is, is built on the Lord Jesus Christ and this book, and you are God's people. And I know you love me. I have no doubt about it. But listen to me. You need to love the next pastor that comes in here and you need to get behind him 100%. Why? Because this is God's work, and you're God's people, and you need to put your trust in God. So you understand what I'm saying? 
And so, uh, you know, we have to be careful in this matter um, of trusting, uh, putting too much trust, uh, confidence in people. You don't want to put your confidence in, the, in an arm of flesh. And uh, then there is the security of powers. And, um, you know, the attitude that uh, we are self-made and can fix all of our problems. That's kind of a, a humanistic philosophy, is that uh, we can fix everything. We expect it. We expect the doctors and science, we expect them to fix all problems. You know what my neurologist said to me over in, uh, in Bellevue after they found out that I had this PLS problem? You know what he said to me? He said, Pastor Blue, we don't know everything. That's what he said. We don't know everything. Um, I didn't respond to him because I already knew he didn't know everything. <laughs> you know, I never assumed that he did. But I think what he was telling me is he had missed the problem in diagnosing it there initially. And we don't know everything. Well, I, I wouldn't hold anybody accountable thinking they know everything. But we get this idea today that we're living in on an enlightened science, uh, science uh, uh, scientific world, you know, and, and we can just fix all problems. And, I mean, if we, if we messed it up, we can fix it. So we get to where it comes to health and, and finances and everything else, and we expect people to fix it. You know what the attitude in America today is? Is that the government is the cause of all the problems and the government can fix it. All the problems that we're having are in Washington, D.C., and uh, we just changed the administration. We can fix the problem. That means government is the problem. Government can fix the problem. But that isn't so. They can't fix all problems. Have you ruled out human nature and free will of the citizen? See? But there is this mentality, and therefore it's easy for people to... to there's an uprising and for people to rebel and for riots because they believe the government can fix it. You caused it, you can fix it. And so uh, there, is this, there is this danger of misplaced trust and uh, false security, which they thought they would find in, 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 uh, in Moab. I want you to look with me at Psalm 10, Psalm 10 and verse 4, <clears throat> talking about power. We might even think we have this power ourselves. But in Psalm 10 and verse 4, this is an interesting verse. Notice it says, The wicked, through the pride of his own heart or countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. The wicked, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. He's too proud. Too proud to pray. Too proud to humble himself. Too proud to admit he was wrong. Too proud to go to the Bible to look for the answer. You know, too proud to say I was wrong. Too proud to say forgive me. Say, the wicked are too proud to do those things. And you need to humble yourself and uh, look at... Uh, uh, look at Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit uh, before a fall. You know, so you don't want to get your nose too elevated. You might not see where you're going. All right, the third, the, the, uh, the next problem is, the fourth one, is the security of our plans. The security of our plans. Now, Imelech and uh, his wife, they had good plans. They had plans, well laid, no doubt. And we must plan. There's nothing wrong with planning. The Lord says, who builds a tower without planning, or who goes to war without planning? So there's nothing wrong with planning, but you don't want to put security in your plans. Someone said, if you want to see God laugh, make a plan. And, but we must plan, but we must never make them a source of security. 
You know, my wife and I, we, uh, a few, just, I don't know, a couple of years ago, we had a plan. I said, I tell you what I think we'll do. We'll buy us a, a pickup truck with a tow package on it, and we'll buy it now, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll plan to have it paid for by the time I put in my 40th year at Open Door, which would be 09, I believe. And um, so our plan was to, uh, after retirement, was to use this, uh, this truck and a, uh, a trailer and do some traveling, and I would contact pastors and see if I could help young pastors in their church and have a ministry doing something. I've, I've discussed it with Jason many times of what I would like to do. And those were, my, those were our plans. Those plans have all been changed, every one of them. I had to sell the truck. I couldn't even crawl up in it. Couldn't get in it. See? And I'm not, it doesn't matter to me. That's, that's immaterial, but I'm, I'm using that to show you that there's no security in your plans. It's okay to plan, but you should always say, if the Lord wills, because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what a day is going to bring forth. Not the weatherman or these fortune tellers or anybody else. You know, and if you buy those fortune teller stuff, I need to talk to you. Okay. And so, uh, you know, you need, to, you need to plan. It's okay to plan. There's nothing wrong with it. But then you ought to have a word of prayer and say, if God wills. Because you don't know what's going to happen on anything. So don't put your security in your plans. You need to put your security in God. And He's the only security you've really got. And so the only place you can find lasting security is in the Bible and in our salvation and in the Lord Himself. The Bible will never fail you and you never lose your salvation now, listen to me. If you could lose your salvation, you've already lost it. You've already lost it. And if you can lose it and not know it <laughs> or not miss it, well, you know, I don't know how you'd ever find it and know you got it back. You know? But you can't, if you could lose it, you've already lost it. You see? And uh, so, and then, of course, the Lord will never fail you. He said, I change not. So was it right for... Uh, 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 Maholan and Kailan to marry these women of Moab? I Probably not. And uh, we can assume that they may have been Jewish proselytes, but that may not be 100% accurate. But you want to remember that uh, this family was down in Moab for a total of 10 years. And uh, you'll notice verse 15 of chapter 1, and I want you to underline something because it emphasizes what I'm trying to say here. In verse 15, back in the book of Ruth, in verse 15, she, that is Naomi, said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people, and what? And unto her gods, plural. So uh, she doesn't sound like a very strong convert to, to, uh, to the God of Israel. And so these boys, probably both of them, were in error marrying these two Gentile women. And uh, of course the Bible has a lot to say about that. The Bible warns against unequal partnerships between, of believers. And... Uh, this rule extends to business partnerships and to marriages and religious affiliations. I'm going to give you a verse. I want you to go look at it with me. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and down about verse 14. And everybody here needs to see this verse, especially our young people and our college young people and our married young people. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6.14 be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now listen, in the Old Testament, Israel could not 
put a, uh, an oxen and a mule and hook them up together to pull a plow. You couldn't do that. You couldn't put the two of them together. Now the reason for that is God was reminding Israel all the time that they were a separated people. Now that's why they couldn't plant diverse seed in the same garden. They couldn't wear garments of the different materials. They couldn't put wool and silk together. And, uh, and so there were certain things there that they couldn't do to remind them that they were a separated people. So, God, so Paul, uh, I think, alludes to that when he says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Just like a donkey and an oxen are not to be hooked up, you're not to be hooked up with unbelievers. Now how would that be? Well, it would be in marriage. And so a Christian should not marry an un unsaved person. And this idea that, well, I'll marry them and win them to the Lord is obedience, a disobedience in the very beginning. You think you're going to disobey God and it's going to turn out good? Now the way to not get married to an unsaved person is don't fall in love with them. And the way to not fall in love with them is don't date them. Now, I, I, there's, there's one guy that I went to Bible college with, and I don't know where he's at right now. His brother pastors in Illinois, and I know that Dave Arnston and his wife have been to their church. What town is that? Uh, Bloomington. Bloomington, Illinois, okay. I went to school with him. He's the old, older brother. And then the younger brother, I think it was Danny, I think that was his name. He was a very good-looking guy and an athletic, you know, kind of like I am. And... Um, but he, uh, and all the girls, you know, they were just Google-eyed around him. And he would, he would invite them on a date. He'd invite them to come to church because his dad was a pastor. So he would get these girls and bring them to church and, and keep bringing them to church till, he got saved, till they got saved, and then he'd dump them and go get another one. <laughs> he wasn't looking for a mate. He just, that was, you know, that'd be quite a ministry, guys. Okay. <laughs> And uh, somebody will get on that and start a mission program, you know. <laughs> My mission is to lost girls. <laughs> I don't know what I'm starting here. <laughs> anyway, you need to make sure that you don't get yourself in an emotional situation with an unsaved boy or an unsaved girl because once you get there and you think you're in love with somebody, your reasoning checks out. And if you're not a strong, first of all, if you're a strong Christian, you're not going to be there anyway. But if you're not a strong Christian, um, you're going to disregard. And I've had, over the years, listen, I've had dozens of men and women who paid absolutely no attention, uh, uh, paid any attention to what I said on this matter. They go right ahead. They go right ahead. They don't care. They're in love with them. And love blinds people, and uh, blind people step in a ditch. You don't want to be blind. Be not unequally yoked. You should not, in my opinion, you want to be careful in hooking up in a business venture with unsaved people. Um, even with saved people, you want to be careful. And especially if they're church members where you go to church, you want to be careful because that thing turns, it always turns sour. I've watched it over the years. People who were friends became enemies because of some business dealings. And it's not a good thing, it's a, you know. And so you want to be careful. But God is telling you not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath, hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what uh, communion hath light with darkness? So uh, these young men... I am confident that they were out of the will of God when they married these women. And I think their father was out of the will of God in bringing the family out of, uh, of Bethlehem, Judea. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we look at these things and we think, oh, I'll be secure and I'll be happy and, and I'll work it out because I'm smarter than God on this matter. And God warns you about it. And, uh, you know, my mother married an unsaved man. My stepdad was unsaved. And uh, 
My mother would go to church. I never saw my stepdad go to church one time in his life, ever, ever. I don't know if he ever came to hear me preach. Did he? Okay, I guess he had to be in church. Okay, where was that? Soap Lake? Okay. All right, I guess he did come once. <laughs> and here's the sad thing. My mother, you know, she liked to visit with people, and she'd have people over to the house. My dad's not going to talk to them. He's lost. So he's gonna, he goes to the bedroom and sits in there. So my mother's out there, you know, trying to entertain this couple. She wants to go to an outing where there's families and something, a fellowship at the church. He's not going with her. So she goes to church by herself all the time. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, he was a, he was a good provider. He never was, uh, never was uh, mean to me. He, he loved me and took care of me. But he never picked up a Bible that I ever saw in all the years I knew him. And my son Randy witnessed to him one time, and he said, You know what? I'm just as saved as you are. I don't want you talking to me about it anymore. That's his grandson. So here and there, you will hear of a story to where somebody married an unsaved person, and the unsaved person got saved, and it worked out okay. And what that does is that deceives you to thinking, then mine will work out okay too. And that's the deception. So you better pay attention to the Lord. And, uh, you know, I've told you the story about the two tears in the, in the stream. And one tear said to the other tear, why are you here? And she said, I lost my lover. And why are you here? She said, I found him. <laughs> so, you know... Uh, don't be too hard on yourself. The person you lost might be a blessing to you in the long run. So you need to stay close to God and put God first, not marriage first, not dating first. You put God first. And God will bring the person into your life that He wants you to have. You say, well, I haven't heard. Well, you need to trust God. All right, so I'm confident that there's a reason most men, and this is, you know, I wanted to get on the phone and call Brother Ruckman the other day. I need to ask him this question, and I thought he's going to say, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You know, so you, you like this, you know, you, you think you've got a good question. But, you know, I, I wondered, I've talked to my wife about this, that, uh, you know, why is it that men 99% of the time die before their wives? I don't know. Maybe it's what they're cooking. I have no idea. <laughs> I heard about two guys that hadn't seen each other in years, and they were talking to each other, wanting to know how they were doing. And one guy said, I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm fine. How's your wife? And he said, well, she, um, she, she's, she's dead. Well, that's too bad. How did she die? Well, she ate some poison mushrooms. Well, that's too bad. Well, it's okay. I've remarried. Oh, well, where is your wife? Well, she's in the hospital. Well, what's wrong with her? She got her leg broke. How? She wouldn't eat her mushrooms. <laughs> I think that's funny. That's funny. So I got, to, I got to thinking about this thing, and it may be nothing. It may just be stupidity on my part, but I got to thinking about this thing that in most churches you have widow women. You don't have widowers. You have just a few, if any. And uh, all through the Bible, it, it's the widow. And this thing is universal. Doc, why is that? Why the women, why the men die first? Too much stress? You don't know. Okay, <laughs> she's, she's with this other doctor. We don't know everything. Okay. But anyway, so I thought I'd call Brother Pete and ask him, but I haven't got around to it. But I'm confident that there is more than just a, uh, just a natural scientific reason for it. You know, I really do. I think there's, uh, I think there's, uh, there's something to it. And I, I indicated in my notes here the reason that they might, uh, that the, the reason is that they might more fully trust in God. Women 
almost without fail, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they look to their husband as a provider and a protector, which he should be. And, uh, you know, they see the husband as their security. And uh, when the husband dies, especially in this part of the world in Bible lands, when they died, the woman was left without any provision. So who's going to take care of her? Well, God said He would take care of the widows. In the New Testament, the church is supposed to take care of widows who qualify. The church has a response. So it is God ordained that the church take care of widows who qualify as widows indeed. And I want you to look with me at Psalm 65, or Psalm 68 along this line. Psalm 68 and verse 5. Because God said He would be to the childless and to the widows something special. In Psalm 68, verse 5, He said, I will be a father to the fatherless. And you know that the truth is, a, a lot of kids who's, who've been abandoned by their fathers and kids who grow up in orphanages, they really have a special place in the heart of God. He said, I'll be a father to the fatherless. He said, what does the father do? He takes care of them. And notice he said, I will also be a judge uh, and a judge of the widows. That is, he will defend their case, their cause. And Israel had a, a great responsibility uh, concerning widows in their land. And so I think that the reason, and if it, if it is a reason, and I may be a million miles off, but I really believe that it is so that they might more fully trust the Lord. God many times takes away from us our securities and takes away from us that which we're leaning on. Not that you would fall, but that you would trust Him more fully. You know, I would say to you women here, you know, uh, if the Lord tarries, I think the percentage is going to stay the same. And many of you women down the, in the years to come, you're going to be bereaved of your husbands. And uh, you, need to, you need to turn to God in that time and look to Him. Because He hasn't forgotten you. And He loves you and will take care of you. And that's His promise. So here Naomi and... Uh, and these two daughter-in-laws, they're all three widows now. None of them have any children. And they need to throw themselves on God. Now, um, we find Naomi then, and it's an interesting thing when she goes back to the land because, you know, her name, Naomi's name, means beauty and pleasantness. But uh, she's no longer beautiful or pleasant. Uh, she is now stripped of her husband, of her two sons, of her security and her joy. And she has absolutely nothing. She's about as destitute as you can get. And things in Israel were bleak. But Israel, but nothing really could have happened to her in Israel, in her own village, that would have brought any more sorrow or uncertainty than she was experiencing in Moab. She was no better off. And so uh, those brief ten years, I think, were a great tribulation period for her. And the joy, you know, and I think about her, uh, you know, her name means beauty and pleasant. And I see someone who, is, who, who has a face that is furrowed with, with sorrow. You, her, you know, I've been to India and looked into the eyes of some of those women. And they almost look dead because they work so hard in the hot fields and they're, they're gaunt and their cheekbones stand out and really you know they're living on a starvation diet 
and uh, they were building a, a highway when, when I was there one time, and these trucks would come along the dirt road and they would dump their, their load of gravel ever so often, and the rocks, the rocks were, were at least the size of my fist. And these women would be out there working and they would get a basket, a, a, a basket of rocks. And they could just barely lift it. Sometimes they had to get someone to help them and they would put it on their head. And they would walk over to a hole or a low place in the road and they would dump that. And they would do that for eight hours a day. Maybe they made 50 cents, uh, $50 a month. Maybe. And, uh, you know, I, you just see the sorrow and the sun has uh, baked their skin. And the joy is gone and life is drained out of her face. And when she gets home, she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. She has her name changed. And I think it all started back there when her husband assumed that they would be more secure somewhere else, out of the will of God, than in the famine back in their own land. Now, I'm not saying that you should never go anywhere when there's a problem. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I am trying to say that you should really pray and seek God's leadership before you, before you run every time there is a problem. Otherwise, you're going to be running all your life because problems will always follow you. You can't get away from problems. A change of real estate doesn't change your problems. A new coat of paint in the house doesn't change your problems. A vacation is not going to change your problems. Buying a boat and a camper and, and spending more money and buying, that's not going to change your problems. See? So find out what God's trying to teach you in the midst of adversity. Don't get unequally hooked up with other people. And you need to stay close to the Lord and in the book because that's where the security is at. It's in your salvation, in the Bible, and in the Lord Himself. Does that make sense to you?